Hi, hello everyone. Welcome to another art conversation. It's a beautiful summer day here in um, Oyster Hyde Lake in Ellenville, New York, and I hope you enjoy your summer. Uh, we are here today with the most talented artists. Um, when I'm saying, and most talented artists in storytelling, when I'm saying storytelling, I mean she documenting real life she documenting culture so um artwork of diane britain Dunham, if i pronounce your name correctly uh, then right. you can, uh correct me are all about documenting life culture and history welcome to our conversation Diane. thank you so much it's wonderful to be here today Thank you. Thank you for finally um, get this chance to have um, a conversation with you. And yes. um, all right, Diane, let's just start with our uh, conversation and please tell us about yourself, who you are, about your background and how you start this wonderful journey. Well, um, as you said, you said the name right. It's Diane Britton Dunham. And I am an artist, and I guess you could say I am a um, cultural preservationist because I work to preserve um, our culture through artwork and um, to try to um, document our history through a visual journal or, or visual representations through the paintings that I create. And I've been doing it about 30 years now, started about 30 years ago, and um, kind of started with doing my family's genealogy, and I became interested in history and talking to my uh, grandparents and the elders in the Gullah community, and um, began to paint their life stories, basically. Um, they would tell the stories, and I would, I, would, I would paint them and put it out there. So, uh, in which each, with each series, there's usually a ton of research that went with it as the inspiration. And I guess that's how I became a historian as well, because I would document uh, whatever history that was going on at that particular period and time. And so, you know, along that journey, that 30 years of research, documenting, um, sort of became a historian. That's true. And this uh, type of artwork you're doing today, is that something you used to do from the beginning? How you start, like besides, you know, this documenting, uh, did you used to do different type of art um, before starting, like, you know, culture, starting to use culture and real life in your artwork? Yeah, I guess you could say so. Um, initially, when I, well, I've always been an artist ever since I was a little girl. I've always wanted to be an artist. And, uh, my first interest was probably in fashion design and fashion illustration. Okay. And uh, I took some courses in fashion design, not necessarily art classes. I like to say I'm a self-taught artist because I don't have a fine arts degree. Uh, but I did take some classes in fashion design. I wanted to be a designer and I uh, went to design school. So that initially was the beginning. And, and you'll see a lot of that. You'll probably see a lot of that in, 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 in my the women in my in my art it's been brought up about you know that that fashion design background is in there exactly so that that's basically you know one of the things that i started off doing and uh and i was interested in history but my interest in uh southern american african-american history uh came when i started doing research in my family that's very interesting. And um, how has your work, your artwork changed over the time? Oh, it's changed a lot. Um, initially, I guess when we talk about techniques and mediums. Uh, um, technique and medium and the subjects. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, well, the subjects, the subject, I always painted what was um, initially when I was younger um, was basically what was going on current you know um you know modern art and currently and i was like and then i became interested in really primitive art 
um, I guess when I was around like 16, 17, I was interested in primitive, primitive works. Um, I started off in oils and I had a, had a reaction to oils uh, and the chemicals that, and that was like back in the like 70s. So they didn't have it perfected as they do now. Like they have water-based oils now, no such thing. And so I, I became interested in watercolor. And then the, the, during the fashion design, it became like using Indian ink and washes and, and using, so that then we were mostly paper medium on that. Um, then over the years, um, I switched back, I discovered the acrylic medium and how to use the acrylic mediums um, to mimic oils, to, to work like oils. And uh, so a combination of, let's say, oils and water media and that. And I experimented with other forms like batik, wax resist, um, dyeing. Um, so working with textiles and different fabrics um, to loosen up, to get, you know, experience in that. So the different mediums are um, to sort of perfect, uh, I guess what I see, sort of a style, you know? Um, but my subject matter became women, women and uh, primarily women and the family and, and, and documenting that, you know, um, um, what uh, this painting we have here now is called Our Story. And I did this for, for Penn Center, which is a historical school here. Um, um, I did this for the Heritage Day celebration. And Penn School is the first school for freed enslaved people in the country, um, in the nation. And um, it was an honor to do this. Um, it's also part, designated as part of the Reconstruction Era National Park, the building that you see in the background. And this particular painting incorporates all the elements of this, the history. Um, the uh, religion, as you see the gentleman in the background, you see the lady in the red and yellow polka dot dress, uh, printed dress. The man behind her is holding a Bible. So he represents religion, and, and which is strong in, 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 the, in the community, very the backbone and the core of the community. And then sweetgrass basketry was something that was brought from West Africa. So the woman that, that's sitting in front of him is doing what's called a sweetgrass basket. And that was the basket that be, is a, we, we call a utilitarian art um, now, but then it was a necessity because one of the things that the enslaved people were brought to the Sea Islands for was the cultivation of rice. And these baskets were, were instrumental in the use of processing, um, doing the, uh, getting the hull from the rice. So there was a, 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 a winter basket that they used to, uh, with the rice. So um, that's the sweet scratch basketry. Now you see behind her, next to her, a lady with a spoon in her hand and a bowl, and she's calling people to come eat. And so that represents the unique food of the culture, uh, of, of the culture. And then um, music, if you could look closely under the tree, you see there are some musicians uh, playing a guitar and strumming uh, music and dancing. And um, so that's food, music, and agriculture um, is represented with, you see the woman who has the basket over her head with some of the, the vegetables and food from, from harvest that they'd harvest. Um, the fishing and shrimping, of course, is represented by uh, the gentleman with the shrimp net uh, in, in the denim overalls. He has a shrimp shrimp net in his hand, which were hand, which was hand sewn. They, they, made, they, they made their own nets in those days. They were hand sewn made nets. And then you see the little boy in the background representing uh, fishing. And an important component of the Penn campus was that it was a school. And um, you see the young lady with the glasses on holding the book, which says our school, I mean, our story. And behind her, the building with the red top is the building that was designated as the um, national a monument uh, Reconstruction Era National Monument, 
um, and it's called Dara Hall, and it's located on the Penn Center campus. So all of that story is in that particular painting. Wow. I could go and in, but we don't have enough time. <laughs> yeah, I know you can. You can write a book, definitely. Yeah, I, I you know, should. You see, like, and why most of your character are faceless? Ah, uh, yeah, and that's what that's a question that I get from everyone. And okay, the reason that there are no faces in my paintings is that is the x factor i call that the x factor and that's because um if i've done everything that i'm supposed to do in in the painting that I, i'm i'm creating for you to view if through their their mannerisms their expressions the the background um the the gestures and the way that they're standing their body language if i've conveyed all of the story and all of that, you, the onlooker, will project the face on each individual there. And you will be able to um, see their face and their emotion if I've done my job right. And if you look at it, most of the time, once you get into to my paintings and to the artwork, you actually don't realize there's no face because you do see their personalities. It is my hope that you'll see their personalities and that you'll feel the emotion of what's going on at that particular event or in that particular scene, you'll become a part of it. And because I don't know the, what the ancestors look like exactly, you know, I leave it up to you, the onlooker, to see them and they come through to people. And that's my hope. You, you leave it to observer to use their imagination. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, by the way, Diane has painting with face too. So it's, that shows the ability. She's like, you know, she's really good in every direction and in every point. Thank you. But this is the, like, you know, the meaning, the symbols behind uh, faceless work of you which is you want people to imagine and you want people to add especially in the, their story yes especially in these historical pieces i want that um to be i want the uh onlooker to be a participant in the artwork exactly. I, want, I want i want them to you participate want to in do everything you want some participation you want the observer also to participate and use their imagination Exactly. Kind yeah. of like put face on all those stories. Exactly. That's the exact small, word. Yeah, very smart way to do that. I want um, yeah, we have you. so much, and we have very limited of time. So I'm. <laughs> well, you know, I mentioned earlier we we can go you know quickly through this. I mentioned earlier you know about how how important religion was. Yeah. And these there was these, there were these little if you visit our sea sea islands you see there are these small praise houses they're very small. Um, and they were used for places of worship, and there's still um, still some of them on the island. And so um, these structures are really, really um, sacred in the community. Um, and it was a place where they also did what was called the seeking, where you would go, you would go to the praise houses. Sometimes you would go into the wilderness, and you would seek a vision or a dream. To be told who your spiritual guide or leader will be, and then you can become baptized. So um, some West African yeah, traditions and of as well. And dancing. This one is called the Ring Shop. Okay, and this is also um, um, from a West African origins that was carried over into um, the Baptist religions. Um, Baptist religion, and it's called a Ring Shop. Okay, and it's just a series of stomping your feet and uh, clapping your hands in a circular motion um, to um, when you're filled with the spirit or filled with, with spirit. And, yeah, the um, thing about African culture, almost everything. Um, exactly. You know, they are very close to spirit, and they believe in the spirit of everything. And uh, I'm teaching African art and I'm almost like, you know, I'm not saying like 100% familiar with all the culture, but almost I know overall view of that. And then when religion came to most African um, region, it didn't change that type of belief they had. And that's the, that's the amazing thing about those African culture. 
which is yeah, it, exactly yeah. it, it just it, it was um you know it it manifested itself within the worship and one of the things about the sea islands was because of the isolation of being on the islands um the lack of assimilation with the, the rest of the, the world basically um must much of the west african origins were preserved in that so that's that's one of them that you see here and this is an important part of religion and and not only with the sea island religion um, um also most african american southern traditions incorporate this type of wing shot or shot in, in in spiritual worship uh, do you have any um like you know any particular person who influenced your world or who are your biggest influence you know in terms of artists uh, as, as, art, as, as artists um, as, in, as artists right not not in terms of culture of course like the subject matter is culture and story but in terms of technique in terms of oh, yeah know, yeah uh, well orig originally um I, when I was a little girl, um, a young girl, I, I, in the museums, I fell in love with Gauguin mm -hmm. and his Tahiti series. Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, that was sort of um, my first real exposure to 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 the type of art that I would later become to want to to try to paint in some of my paintings, especially pastoral scenes and outdoor scenes tropical um that and then of course the in the low country art scene of course we've had uh, jonathan green was is a very well-known artist in the region and it, and um uh, it's sort of a similar style what they call low country artist style but he's most well known for it um in that but it's called a low um caribbean art if you take a look at caribbean art and uh you'll see a lot of the same um tropical influences of the bright colors the geometrical shapes the bold bold lines in it um lined art um so i say you know i i loved african art and caribbean art and and that's a big influence on look <clears throat> on the low country art on all low country art that you see yeah exactly i can see all of these uh, particular gogan you know and those primitive what he used to do um, exactly I, and yeah, the primitive i um i was always a big fan of the artists of the harlem renaissance of the renaissance earlier like horace pippen and um some of those artists of that era um who were big influences as well so um those yeah, a lot of them, but those are some ones that stand out. Yeah, and then putting all those together with real life and real story and real culture make the world more meaningful, you know. Something mm -hmm. people understand and touch. And some people when for example when they see this art world, they can feel it. It has a feeling in it, you know, something mm -hmm. you can it touch every person part. And that, yeah, like these are quotes. And yeah. and you know one of, one of the things with quilts that important besides being another form of utilitarian art something that was useful that we did that but made us a piece of art it was also comforting to have scraps of, of cloth from loved ones um, from family members who maybe have gone on um, or people who who we love. And it was comforting to have an old shirt. And this one, the first one I called Papa's shirt because it's like a flannel, piece of his flannel shirt that's my grandfather's shirt that's in, um, in a quilt there. Um, that would be like imagining me and my grandmother in a quilt that she made with his shirt in it. And so <laughs> these are kind of things that um, um, were comforting. They kept you warm. They served a purpose, but beautiful pieces of artwork as well, and uh, and something like a memory, a memory um, piece of a piece of history being sewn in together that you could just wrap up. Yeah, that was the whole um, actually fun. Uh, actually, the 
whole idea of that when they used to make it they would tell a story you know as they make it with their grandkids and the family sitting winter night and you know yes <laughs> yes and do we this... have model for this or all your painting are from memory some of, some of the paintings are from memory and um from my imagination the models are usually the ones that have faces um so when you see when some that have faces are I've probably used a family member or someone as a model with those. Okay. I, I don't know if I included any in this slide series. I should have, but. Yeah, but I have um, your face. I have your uh, website. I'm going to okay. Know. Yes. Uh, but yeah, but, uh, but usually these are from stories um, that in my mind I'm trying to tell and, and they're coming from my imagination. Um, this, this one though is coming from a photograph, basically. It's coming from um, a very dear friend who, who has, her name is Aunt Pearlie Sue, and uh, Anita Singleton Prather uh, is, is, her, is her real name, but Aunt Pearlie Sue is her stage name. And she does a theatrical performance um, on, and it's called The Gala Christmas. And so this is sort of taken from her play that she does on the Gala Christmas. And it has a lot going on in it. And I'll, I'll try to be brief, but brief in it. But um, it has it also has a quote in it, which is called the North Star quote. And during Christmas time on the uh, plantations, things were a little less strict, um, um, a little uh, it, it, less restrictive, and you would have um, visitors from other plantations who would bring their um, enslaved people with them. And oftentimes, these were family members of some of the people on that plantation. So they would have like a get together, and they encouraged they encouraged everyone to embrace the nativity story, to embrace the Christmas story. They wanted them to embrace Christianity. And so in this particular instance, she's telling the story of the um, follow the star, follow the North Star. But in all actuality, it's sort of a hidden in, from the Hidden in Plain Sight series. Hidden in Plain Sight is part of the Underground Railroad series. So when she's saying to them, it's time, you know, follow the star, she's actually talking about follow the North Star, that there's going to be a, an escape tonight. And when you see this particular quilt come out, which is called uh, one of the Underground Railroad folks, which is like, I think, eight basic symbols now. It was more, but eight. If you see this quilt come out called the North Star Quilt, then we want you to follow the star tonight because we're making an escape. Yes. So that's what's going on in this particular painting. Wow, oh, very, very interesting. I mean, there is a show in Netflix, actually. You should, I don't know, <laughs> uh, for this story and railroad and underground railroad. <laughs> oh, I have to it's, it's sort of like, and then, and then, of course, he's singing "Follow the Drinking Gourd," which is also "Follow the the North Star," because the drinking yeah. gourd is the is the dipper, which is yeah. yeah. So it has actually um, religious reference as well as like you know um, a cultural reference, history reference, like you know all kind of reference to that little star up there yes and, uh, my advice to you today would be to write a book and uh, explain all your art forms so i'm that, that is if you that's, have in, a, that's in process and praying oh, and a chance to get it finished <laughs> definitely let us know and we would love to see and read and see all these stories <laughs> would be yeah fun. i have so many of them bro oh, gosh i hold body work i guess i could do a couple books for them yeah definitely you have to do it you have to do it yeah, yeah. definitely this this is a similar one this is this is the north star um again this is a modified north star and i made this one up i made that pattern up and that particular north star is a modified north star yeah but um hidden in plain sight, but this is airing out the quilts and you take out the quilts and you would air out all the quilts. Um, and, um, and this is sort of self-explanatory, you know, so it's hidden in plain sight, but then we have all these quilts that they take out, put the airing in. It's a day out and um, there's a North Star quilt there. 
yeah. <laughs> and this is a reference this is a picture uh, to reference you have it here right yes yeah that was the, the reference in pulling out the uh, star that you see on the side of there hanging on the line which is yes actually the centerpiece of the painting but i just sort of put it on the side because i want it to be i want you to imagine what it would be like just walking by and you didn't know what was going on or you walking by with the knowledge that you're looking for a certain symbol and what it would be like exactly exactly um and that's another one that's the log cabin quote there i did the, when i i did actually i did the, the underground railroad series quote series paintings and that one is um you know you, if you see in this quote that meant you found a safe place that's the cabin the log cabin quote very interesting. So all these are secret code. They used to use it during that, um, like you put that, what, underground label. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's some people debate whether or not it was actually happened. But I have to say this, if you think about, I don't know, I think it was close to like maybe 100,000 people who, who, who escaped or found contacts to escape um, during that time period. Um, you were that reading reading and writing was illegal you didn't have any there was no internet okay <laughs> there was no way to communicate with each other but yet all of this information was communicated through vast uh different plantations which were spaced acres and miles apart from each other there had to be a communication a subtle communication system in place and so it's highly probable that this something like this and other things had to happen. They had to have some type of um, direction, yeah. devices, yeah. Yeah, to some kind of to give them direction. You know what, Diane, the way we're going right now, we may end up to doing the same thing in future. Exactly. Yeah. And that's exactly. A surviving, so we have to plan. I was, uh, exactly. I was told by an elder. When I started doing this, and I did this back in like 2006, and when I was interviewing one of the elders about this, and they said it was just kept a secret then, and it should be kept a secret now, she said to me, she said, because you don't know when we'll need this again. I know, yes. The way and she said, and that's why it's not documented. So you have some people debate whether or not it really happened, but you have to believe there was something in place exactly something for people to, to talk and communicate yes because how else did they do it you think about harriet tubman and she came through this area right here and all the people that she freed and here in Buford, not only that she worked as a spy and she freed 700 enslaved people in this area and took over a fort here yeah. how were you how are you communicating this one this one is also part of the series yeah and this one is called shoe fly and shoe fly was i always say was like your concierge okay um everybody who who was in the know about it knew who shoe fly was shoe fly is just an anonymous secret name you know code name like in a spy book code name shoe fly and um when you see this quote come out you are to contact shoe fly go to shoe fly's cabin to get information about uh, the escape. And so that particular print um, pattern that you see is called shoe fly in the quilt. Yeah. Um, and so that's shoe fly. This one here is, is sort of part of the, the code. Um, like I said, it was eight basic ones, but it's, not, it's something like it's a lot of them. It's more than just eight. I forgot. I mean, I did this so long ago. But this one is um, the drunkard's path and going by and the drunkard's path is actually the pattern in the center of the quilt that you see here um that sort of zigzaggedy pattern in that and that just simply meant to um um go in a zigzag don't don't go in a straight line you know go in a zigzag and um it's harder to follow you it's harder to track you but also um it's supposed to have been for evil spirits as well because they believed that evil spirits was dumb they were stupid and so um it was pretty easy to distract an evil spirit yeah. so if you go zigzag it would confuse <laughs>
Uh, I wish I wish we had time to go through all. Yeah, of yeah, I know. I could, so, I could go on forever. <laughs> yeah, and as I told you, you have to um, you have to write a book, and I, I would love this. to. I'm sure everyone would love to hear. And then um, she has this beautiful website, and um, you can see her artwork. Uh, my internet, I mean, up in mountain here in um, Alambal, and my internet is not um, so fast to open everything. But um, yeah, she has this in gallery. You see most more of her artwork and everything and all the story, which is they are so interesting. And you can see this beautiful agriculture, fishing, and all storytelling um, yes. in your website. Uh, which I enjoyed actually uh, watching everything. Uh, so uh, one more thing, what you're doing during this pandemic and during this time, are you working any um, project for 2020 and what happened? Well, yeah, you know, surprisingly, I was pretty busy. 2020 was really busy. Um, you know, it, when it started off, of course, everything was canceled. Um, as far as like tours and everything going 2020 and shows. However, you know, we started converting like everyone else to Zoom and doing online things. And I became pretty busy um, doing, uh, you know, talks and um, online exhibits and uh, just stayed real busy. Um, and then at the end of the pandemic, I said, well, what we thought was the end of it, I don't know if it's ever what's going on now. Um, I did did a couple of shows. Um, and right now I'm at the Delta Arts Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Okay. Um, a, a full, full exhibit there. I mean, a real exhibit, not an online exhibit. Um, but I'm still a lot of online shows and did a lot of commissions and just stayed pretty busy. Yeah. Do you have any final word for our guest today? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, like I say, it's been a great experience um, being a part of the National Association of Women Artists. I want to thank Nala for this opportunity to come and sit and talk to you today. Um, it, it has, you know, some of the shows that I mentioned that I've been a part of or um, had an opportunity to um, be a, a part with was with Nawa. Um, to, I guess, one of the other things is to look up um, the Sea Islands, um, follow through and, and on our history here because it's in jeopardy, okay? The, the, the developers are taking over the area. Um, the, the land is being taken basically from the original um, people, the indigenous people who, who live in the Sea Islands. Um, so if there's some way that you can lend your support and um, offer anything, any kind of help to help preserve this way of life, I think that I would appreciate, we would appreciate it. Yeah, and then looking back to the heritage, to culture, to where you came from, you know, it's that's just, very, um, you know, that's, that's that's something always most artists are trying to do today. You know, it makes your work, your artwork as well as your life more beautiful. Um, anyway, uh, if you want to see more of her beautiful artwork, this is her website, and there are you can reach out to Diane through this art through um, her website as well. And always um, feel free to reach out to us at email as well as we have now Instagram. If you are now a member and you like to be in our show, you can just PM me in this Instagram art in conversation with her. Uh, Diane. Thank you very much. I can't thank you. Uh, thank you enough, and I can't say how I enjoy our conversation, in particular your artwork, and I'm looking forward to see your book. Well, thank you. I enjoyed being and here. Let us all know, and we would be happy to see and even, I'm sure, uh, to participate in publication and everything. Thank you very oh, much. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. All right.